great pleasure to introduce Zainab Salvi, who will serve as the moderator of the, the panel the symposium that is entitled Ensuring Women's Rights in Times of Conflict and in Times of Peace. Zainab is the founder and CEO of Women for Women International, which is an organization that provides women survivors of conflicts with tools and resources to move from victimhood to active citizens. Over the last 15 years, Women for Women has supported 153,000 women in nine countries. Zainab has received numerous awards for her work. In 2007, she was selected as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. In 2006, Women for Women International received the very prestigious Conrad M. Hilton Humanitarian Prize, the world's largest humanitarian award. Ms. Salvi has dedicated her life to the belief that stronger women build stronger nations. In for this introduction, appreciate it, and I am such a privileged woman to be in the company of not only incredibly courageous women, but uh, as you said, incredibly poetic as well. Um, I think it's also a critical time for us to get together and, and get uh, your views on the solutions for the countries that, or, or your perspective, or woman perspective, for how to build peace in the countries where you come from. Uh, there isn't a more critical and historical time for us in America to have this discussion and to hear your views than it is now as we have a new administration and we're all preparing for a new uh, discourse in, in, in a lot of things, including world politics. Um, one of the most important things as someone who, uh, who works in war is how do we understand war not only from the frontline discussion but from the backline discussion as well. We often in America or in the Western world talk about war only from a military discussion, only the fighting and the, the bombing and all of that. How it is criti how do we need uh, how do we get into the discussion of understanding it, not not only understanding war but understanding peace from a backline discussion? How do we really look into the building of a sustainable peace? And so I have my first question is uh, Yanar. Um, which is an honor to be in her company as a fellow Iraqi woman. Um, you know, particularly about Iraq, and I think everyone wants to hear your voice now more than ever uh, before. Everyone is talking about Iraq, the withdrawal of the troops, the keeping of the troops, all of the, the withdrawal of the troops, inshallah. Uh, <laughs> um, what in your perspective, but the, the, in other words, the discussion is limited to the military discussion still. What, in your perspective, in your views, are the critical discussions of how to build peace in Iraq that are not being addressed at the moment in the political discourse? Of course, there's the civil side and there's the military side, but there's something in the middle that doesn't get mentioned a lot, the paramilitary groups in Iraq, which have made it part of their political agenda to kill women all over the cities. When women are being killed and dumped on the side of the street as an outcome to the chaos that happened in Iraq, it's not considered news. Not in Iraq, not in the outside world. When the hospitals cannot function well and uh, pregnant women cannot pay for their hospitalization to have childbirth, this is not considered news. Um, when, when the Constitution is written in a way that women have totally lost their rights and our rights were surrendered to Sharia, this is not considered news. It's, in our view, it's a genocide committed against the current and the future. Um, uh, the, the, the uh, women of Iraq and how is it possible that it is not considered news so uh, when the women are covered and veiled politically in ways that we have not witnessed before in Iraq that is not considered news we hear that it is called our culture in Iraq being Afghanized in a way that we have turned into an Afghanistan under Taliban within a few years is not considered news. All of this is happening, and many of us are on the ground to witness it, 
to say that it is there and that we will not be quiet about it. Uh, in Iraq and in the Middle East, in general, you turn on the TV, you, in every other channel, you see a woman that is being humiliated, is being beaten, is being told to keep her limits. All the media tools are misogynist. Women have been systemically uh, pushed into a very bad place in the society. And this cannot happen in times of peace. This could not have happened if the change in Iraq against Saddam could have come in another way. There it is possible to do because Iraq and all of the Middle East is under war. In Iraq, it is direct war. In, in, the, in the Middle East, as a region, it's indirect kinds of war. So the ways to support and to bring about the other culture that could be called democratic in a way is to have all of these negative sides, net negative aspects worked against. In our opinion, at this point, the state in Iraq is very hard to negotiate with. The state that has been put in place is mostly fundamentalist. In Iraq, we call them political Islamists, and they have totally worked against the rights of women. Um, the media is totally misogynist, and it is time to give women the tools to empower themselves. At this point, we are working towards building our media for women. The women's television, which we call al-musawat, means equality television. And this is where we decided to put a good part of the award money into and to start a possibly groundbreaking tool that could turn the whole thing around for women, starting from Iraq and spreading over to the Middle East. And in our opinion, the rights of women, the freedoms of women is the arena to start in in order to counteract the terrorism that started in 9-11. Military intervention did not do it. Terrorism is more now, not only politically, not against all of the world, but specifically against women. We did not look like black spots before this intervention. And in our opinion, 9-11, the answer, the response to 9-11 should be within the women's rights arena. So that's why we decide to start from there, to start, start a women's television that addresses all of the Middle East and starting from Iraq to tell the women, let's not submit. Let's begin thinking about it. Is this really our culture to submit, to go back to the corners of our houses and hide in them? and to give the misogynist men all the decision-making places, this is not our culture. So this is where we're starting from, a civil answer to a military uh, problem that has started in Iraq. And uh, I'm really happy that you bring up this question because just like the problems against Iraq started from this part of the world, maybe the answers and the solutions could start also from here. Mm -hmm. So I welcome all the people who would like to be part of this project, Al Musawa Television, Equality Television, which will start to empower women from Iraq to the Middle East, and it should be the answer to terrorism against women and terrorism against all of the world, the civilized world. Thank you, Zainab. Thank you. I know a lot of you may have uh, may want to speak more with Yanar as uh, we talk about Iraq and its future. Um, and equally, we'd want to speak with uh, Nadira um, about Palestine and how do we bring peace over there. In your opinion, I mean, I think one of the things that um, Yanar was talking about, which I totally believe in, is violence often starts with women, actually. Yet when we are negotiating peace, and yet when we are talking about the details and how do we end violence and all of that, women's voices are rarely um, uh, implement, uh, incorporated. In your opinion, how do you believe women measure successful and sustainable peace in, different, in, the, def, in the different definitions of peace, economic, uh, from an economic angle, political, uh, human rights, constitutional, democracy, all of that? Well, I... I 
I think that I would like maybe to share where how do I see uh, peace, justice more than peace, though. Because there's, there's also, this is what I believe, there's a serious industry of peace, and everybody <coughs> believes in peace. But when believing in peace, uh, especially from a feminist perspective, my feminism means that as a woman, I'm part, men and women are my, um, my supporters. I do not differentiate or divide and say, okay, well, feminism, my feminism, at least my Palestinian feminism and the way I was doing it, men were not my enemies. Those that were working with me, those that were supporting us, and those that, that are male feminists, as we say. And I guess that reaching justice and reaching um, uh, a better life for us as Palestinians means that we start looking at the structure of violence. We start looking at the structure of violence from different perspectives, from the global to the local. You could never, never, ever divorce what is going on in the field in Palestine and to Palestinians in Israel without looking at the general uh, picture, without looking at what is going on on the global level. And if you look at the way uh, the entire the international community is, is looking at us, whether as Palestinians in Israel or as Palestinians living um, in the West Bank and Gaza, there is, a, there is kind of a dancing with denial, hearing our voices without hearing our voices, Asking us, okay, why don't you, why aren't you peaceful? Why don't you hug each other and live each, with each other? While without even taking into consideration the effect of economic strangulation on us, the way uh, the structure is affecting us, the allocation of resources. If I will give you one example regarding education of Palestinians in Israel, and I will tell you that the state of Israel is supporting uh, the individual Jewish Israeli student six times more than the individual Palestinian uh, Israeli student, both that are citizens of the same state. That is discrimination. And that specific, even in, lo in looking at education by itself and the militarization of our education, and this is the state of Palestinians in Israel, I could tell you that it definitely affects our future, our future uh, support and the way our kids, the way the youth are. So if you, if we don't have specific uh, and, and proper and equal and just uh, allocation of resources, you're definitely going to see society that suffers. If I go to the to the West Bank and Gaza and I could tell you checkpoints, you know, I just finished a study on the militarization of education, and even you know the Palestinian uh, Central Statistic Bureau and the Minister of Education was looking at, and they were naming it school dropouts among girls. And they, they mentioned, and they called it school dropout of girls. Now, when the girl, when kids, when the girls are unable to reach their school because of the military checkpoint, because of the Israeli separation wall, because of the fear of being able to walk in the street, this is not school dropout. This is militarization of their education. This is deprivation of education rather than a school dropout. So I guess that we need to start looking properly. And as an international community, if we will never, if we'll kind of turn a blind eye and look at women's education and, girl, and, and boys' education, because this is my feminism, at least from my own perspective, if we won't look at health, you know, the, la the latest statistics shows, for example, talking about measures. That women previously, 6% used to have uh, to give birth on checkpoints. Now we have much less, which is wonderful. Everybody is looking at it as wonderful. Well, look at it carefully. And this is my feminism. When you look at it carefully, you end up looking that women are so afraid of waiting on checkpoints and not being able to pass, so they're having cesarean operations before time and going to hospitals and having kids before time. And this is why you don't have so many cases of women uh, giving birth on checkpoints. It doesn't mean that their health condition is better. It means that the militarization of our spaces, the militarization of our time, if I want to go to Ramallah, if I want to work in Ramallah, it will take me so long. My time is so important. And furthermore, the production of knowledge. As you know, I'm the director of the Gender Studies Project at uh, Madal Carmel. 
an organization that works on research in Haifa, a wonderful organization that is investing in supporting young scholars, young Palestinian scholars. I could tell you that I have over 20 young Palestinian women that are uh, just finished their masters doing their PhDs. What are the in, uh, employment possibilities for them? When you compare it inside Israel, their ability to find a job, their ability to promote themselves. Well, of course, we can't work in the Ministry of, of, um, of Security Affairs or whatever. We cannot work in, in so many places. Then, you know, we are ghettoized, even in terms of our employment. So our economy and our economic, even if we, we are managing to get the proper education, we're still affected. So looking at education and production of knowledge, our history. Do you think that we've ever had somebody documenting the history of Palestinians in Israel, what happened in 48? Talking to my mom who needed to, to leave Haifa in 48 with three kids fearing being abused and so on due to the establishment of the state of Israel. The stories, the voices are not heard. Our history, our economy, our rights as, and the right to rights, the right to survive as a human man and a woman are not, you know, we're still, we're still struggling. We're still struggling. And I would, I thought that supporting young Palestinian scholars at Madal Carmel and part of the money is going to starting this wonderful fund. And I'm so happy and we're hoping to have more and more donations in order to promote it, is to promote, to bring hope. The, the, between this psychology of humiliation, of you don't have right, you don't have your under military, but, and then asking us to manage and to survive. Well, this is what, what, what always um, requires serious genealogical analysis, looking at the different layers of oppression, and then trying to look at the structure and the way this structure is affecting the individual man and the individual woman. And this is why, and now you were talking about violence. This is why you see violence. It's not because, and this tendency always to culturalize, oh, it's the Palestinian culture, oh, it's the Arab culture, oh, it's the Islamic culture, and this Islamophobia that is, is driving everybody nuts. It's time to start looking at the structure of oppression, at the global power and hegemonic power holders that are, uh, that are further marginalizing us, that are further ostracizing us, that you, they do not see us. And this is where I think that the measures should be not only internal measures, but rather also the role of the global community of international organizations of people like, like wonderful people that are sitting here, my friends that write about it, my friends that donate, you know, and, and that believe in the importance of looking at our history, allowing us to look at our history. And, and you know, my mom has a beautiful proverb in Arabic, we're going back to Peter's argument regarding me, but he who takes off his clothes will end up naked. We are what we are. This is our, you know, we are Palestinians. We are the people that, that have the right to live, to survive, but with dignity and not with humiliation. We'll be able to build and to buy a house in, in our land, in Haifa or in Yaffa, or the way I want, and not ending up fighting in order to be able to survive. This is my feminism. My feminism is not, you know, is not constantly surviving, but living. The question is if we are living. more time. We don't have that much time, so we have a last question for uh, Sapana. Sapana, you work, you have so much background in, in legal and legislative and constitutional aspects of including women in transitional period. Are women included in this particular uh, political uh, structure in, in the decision making in Nepal? And if not, how do you think the political debate will change uh, with women's contribution as a, a full part of it? Uh, today, Nepali women are in mood to convert a reason for insurgency into peace through the inclusion, uh, through the republican system, uh, through the federalist structure, uh, through the democratic values. We are happy that uh, we have opportunity because we are in the constituent assembly 33% women. Uh, we feel like 
we both male and female, will participate in the decision making process, not uh, before like uh, men giving and female begging. One hand, we are proud that we have 33% women in the Constituent Assembly. Diversity has been reflected. But on the other hand, we have a challenge how to make this diversity functionable. But the question which we need to deal today, whether this 33%, even this 33% has been reflected in other state structure or not. If you look at the judiciary, 2%. If you look at the executive, 10%. Um, uh, if you look at the um, um, uh, look at the other civil servants, not even 10%. And within the political structure, if you look at the party structure, only 9% women are within the decision-making process. So, until and unless women are there as a driving force, how can we be involved in the change agenda? And this is uh, where uh, we are thinking. Um, how to make law and politics woman centric Because up to now, law and politics are culturally, politically uh, dominated by male. Uh, and uh, even law is made uh, in male standard uh, and uh, in, in male values for male, uh, for even for female. Uh, but then we see we have some opportunity. Uh, the opportunity how we have uh, we have uh, got at this moment is that we are going to write a new constitution and even to participate in the new constitution uh, the opportunity we got is through the new uh, election uh, law that guaranteed a proportional uh, representation of women uh, in, the, in the constituent assembly. Though I mean again like um, um, we sometimes debate whether law changes society or society responses legal change. But coming from the legal uh, background, what I feel, law is an initiator of change. Law is also indicator of change. Law is also integrator of change. When you have a legal framework, then only you can make a state accountable. And therefore, like if we look into the uh, party manifesto of all political parties, what we have found that all the political parties have said that they will ensure 33%, minimum 33% representation in all the state structure. So we have certain um, tool, uh, even the interim constitution has uh, that provision uh, to make the parties accountable, to make uh, government accountable to ensure the, uh, the participation of women in the, in the state restructure. Uh, but again, like uh, uh, having law is not enough, because one hand, definitely, we, if we really want to be, uh, we, we want to ensure women's participation in politics, there has to be have a legal uh, pro framework. But at the same time, you, we need to create institution. We need to create mindset which is willing uh, to be inclusive. But again, like until and unless. We have certain enabling environment, for example, sharing the responsibility inside the house until and unless women are economically empowered, until and unless women are uh, educated, unless, until and unless uh, woman, uh, woman's capacity as a right holder uh, is, is, is built, uh, no matter what kind of legal framework uh, we may have, no matter, uh, the, even if we will make a new constitution, uh, it is not going to make any difference in the life of women. Therefore, what we feel, a law needs to put into a place for the practical realization of the right. And I believe if we all work together, uh, we can make difference. Thank you. Thank you. We have very short time for questions and answers, but I'll ask you uh, one question for everyone is obviously we are in America are all excited about the new administration coming in and I think the rest of the world is. Uh, the question is what strong message or messages would you most want us to be to bring to the Obama uh, White House and what and to what or and what is the strongest message? What is one message that you want us to bring to the Obama White House from each of the countries? What's that? Well, I'm, I must say that I was extremely excited about this uh, this election, and uh, it's it's wonderful to see someone who was always 
at least, you know, talking about uh, African Americans in here, someone from the margin being at the center. The question is how to recenter the center is the question. And how to recenter the center is by bringing voices of the marginalized, worries of the marginalized, the ordeals of the marginalized into consideration and not being affected by the center and forgetting about the margin. That's the question, you know. And, and, you, and I am hoping, I'm really, I'm, I'm a very hopeful person and I believe in the power of hope. I think that uh, at least from the campaign, during the campaign, I was very excited about, um, about President-elect Obama. And I'm really, really hoping that he'll be able to see us and he will be able to hear us. And he will remember that, uh, that uh, Palestinians uh, are still waiting for someone to consider them and to take them into consideration. That might recenter the center. Thank you. Uh, uh. Before I came, people uh, in Nepal said, see, in uh, USA, uh, the inclusiveness has ensured only now. For the first time, uh, even um, a, a black uh, could be the president. But I don't want to take this message and back to home. Uh, I want uh, that uh, the inclusiveness, which has been uh, represented uh, as a, as a, as a um, head of the uh, government, head of the state, uh, that would translate uh, in the policy, that is translated uh, to the people, and uh, all the developing countries would get uh, adequate attention um, uh, with new political dimension uh, where women's rights are respected and peace is promoted. I guess it's my turn. Uh, one thing comes to mind, if I want to put it in one phrase, pull out the troops, pull out the troops, pull out the troops, immediately. We don't need to wait long. As long as they are there, we're still having problems in Iraq. The, pull, the, the troops need to be pulled out immediately. And of course, we were quite happy to get rid of the bushes who have bombed us first in 91 and then bombed us again in the last years. Um, we hope that the new administration will not be an initiator of wars around the world. We still, to tell you the truth, I get disturbed when I hear over CNN call, the, they're calling Obama uh, commander in chief which tells me, gives me the message that he, is, he has his finger on the trigger because uh, the message of ending racism has started from this part of the world to spread out the whole, to, the, to the whole of the world and it hasn't happened anywhere else. So giving mixed messages of having a different color on the trigger is not really the good thing to do. I think the Democrats should uh, make the message stronger, stop the wars, pull out the troops, and end racism. It's all different sides of one coin, which should be trying to go to a better world. Pull out the troops, that's it. I have to. As you know, I'm an Iraqi myself, so I can't help but ask uh, Yanara another question. But I have another question for everyone. Maybe we start with Yanara and move uh, backward. Is To all recipients, is who are the greatest role models for promoting women's rights in your country, besides yourself, I would say? Um, <laughs> and are there historical figures in your own culture uh, in, in that aspect? Um, so as we answer that, Yanara, I want to ask the question is, beyond pulling out the troops, what next? Pull out the troops, and what's the policy towards Iraq? Um, so if you can just address that and then take on this question about the cultural figures. Any talk about democracy, if women are not equal to men, there is no talk about democracy. When you have a country where the troops have pulled out but have left their forces of darkness who keep us under a dark cover, that is not called democracy. Uh, we need a constitution that acknowledges, recognizes full equality, 
we need the women to have their full rights in this constitution and we do have a history of strong women in Iraq as you know Zainab we had a woman minister in 1950s the equality for women is not a new story in Iraq we just need to claim it back and we need the egalitarians of the rest of the world especially of this part of the world to be with us secular constitution, egalitarian constitution, and enough division of Iraqis on religious, sectarian, and ethnic lines. We do not uh, deserve racism to be applied on us. This part of the world is getting rid of racism, so why export it to Iraq? We weren't like this in the times of the bloody dictatorship, so why now? Democracy cannot be achieved with women veiled, covered, and silenced by force. Women need to speak out and they need to be supported from the side of the world as well as on our side. Thank you. Who are your role models and or role models for women's rights in your country? Uh, there are many. Uh, but for me, uh, most importantly, uh, when I hear pain, when I see pain, suffering, when rights are denied, uh, people cannot get justice. Uh, those people I see as a role model because only they challenge uh, the culture. Uh, sometimes they challenge the law, they challenge the value. Uh, but when a state takes religion and uh, when we are unable to create demarcation between religion and culture, uh, when in the name of protection of uh, culture and religion we continue the discrimination, uh, you cannot protect the right of women. Uh, therefore, uh, religion is a, is, a, is a belief, it's a way of life. And uh, since Nepal has recently declared uh, it as a secular country, um, we have been uh, saying that culture is not a static. Culture is changing. Values are changing. And then we all need to change first ourselves uh, and then uh, respect um, those people who have given their life I remember those people and then uh, work for change, uh, creating uh, democratic values uh, because democracy and um, rights goes together because it, depending on the, the level of democracy and depending on the level of development process, equality can be achieved. Well, it's hard to, to say one person is a role model because I guess that I could start with the young Palestinian girls that, are, that continue to walk the walk and to reach school despite all the hardships and fears of harassment and of abuse, to the wonderful women that are working and writing, to the wonderful women that are sitting here. We have the, Professor Nabil Al-Basil who's working and writing. And these are the women from the young to the to the wonderful scholars that are working and writing and uh, keeping our voices and keeping our work and allowing us to be proud of what we are. When I look at Nabila's writing, when I look at the young women and girls that are reaching the school and you know, hearing them carrying their backpacks, uh, hiding things in their backpacks and, and continuing the walk and looking at the soldiers and being able to to handle the soldiers. Or, or These are the women, and wonderful women, that are writing poetry, that are dancing, that are working, that are fighting, that are raising kids. Women's power of love, women's power of continuation, women's power of survival, women's power of giving, giving life, women's power of love. And love is a practice of freedom. Um, well, it's... It, again, an honor to be in your company uh, in a small way. 
I think uh, the one thing we can all do is uh, not only echo the voices and the views that you brought up today, your voices, but also I would say the one thing that we need to ask is to the White House to invite uh, the woman in the panel today and, and talk with them directly. <laughs> So thank you so much for your contribution and definitely thank you for the Peter and Patricia Gruber Foundation for your own acknowledgement and taking the, and making, uh, bringing it to the limelight, both in your voice and your resources. So thank you. Thank you, Zainab. We could go on and on, I'm sure. This is uh, very rich. Um, we are now at the end of our program, and we'd like to thank Zainab, and we'd like to thank Yanar Mohammed, and Safina Pradhanmala, and Nadira Shalub Kaborkin uh, for their participation, for their work. We hope you keep on and are successful in all that you do. And you have lifted us up, and we hope this has lifted you as well. Um, we thank everyone who has contributed today, and this includes the Gruber Foundation, Sarah, uh, we thank you, Sarah Rea, and we thank Toya Phillips, uh, who has been behind the scenes on uh, many tasks uh, to make today a success, and Bernita Aiken, who is here from our St. Thomas office. We thank the advisors and selection committee members who are with us today, and we especially thank Columbia University and Peter Rosenblum for all that you have done to host us here. Please join us upstairs for a reception on the seventh floor um, in the Case Lounge. Um, it is in room 701. So we will thank you. Let's have another hand for. <laughs>